So here I am with Mark Bristol. Mark is joining us from London. But of course, for those in the industry that know, Mark is a bit famous for having more frequent flyer points than probably anyone else in our industry. I, you know, there's expressions going that Mark offices is, is on the plane. Mark, with all that travel, I thought it'd be fun just to start off. Do you have any, what are your tips to stay healthy for an international traveler like yourself? So uh, you try and fit in four to five days of exercise a week. And, uh, and if you miss out, try and catch up. So that's what I try and do. Um, uh, you know, just a bit of exercise and, and walk. I, I do a lot of walking. Wow. So just the basics. So no secret vitamin C powders or oil of oregano or anything like that. And I guess what uh, my colleagues say, uh, watch what you put in your mouth. <laughs> That's good advice for, for young and old, for all of us. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Mark, I thought I'd like to kind of get going with, uh, in honor of the fact the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame recently uh, announced uh, the inductees or the members for 2022. Now, Barrick has one of the strongest presence in the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame with three members, Peter Monk, Bob Smith, Brian Meikle. You have stated in the past that even at your days at Round Gold, that Peter and Bob were a big influence on you um, at Rangold. So I'd kind of like to start a little bit there. Um, how are those names, Brian, Bob, Peter, how are they still part of the, the Barrick fabric uh, to this day? Uh, uh, of course, Peter is a standout entrepreneur. And, you know, we don't have enough of those um, in the mining industry anymore. And, uh, you know, because mining is a high-risk business, it, it, it draws, to be successful, you have to draw on, creativity and knowledge um and then you've got to be able to be st strong enough to take the risk and 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 successful miners are often uh, come in combinations and a perfect combination was was peter and bob and you know P peter brought the the culture and character to barrack and and bob did the grunt work um and you you can see how quickly and if you look through the mining history when you when you load up with too many and, and not that i have anything against accountants or lawyers or promoters but when they get too too dominant in the board uh, many and there are many many examples of of the companies losing their way and and so you know i think that combination was great it, it also has like rand gold you know i always talk uh, you know one is because i i modeled uh, rand gold on that early barrack, that very entrepreneurial, we can do it, uh, small, uh, small um, uh, head office or no head office, and uh, uh, act like owners. And, uh, and of course, those uh, gentlemen were owners. And so it was, um, and, and I think the memory is still there in, uh, in, in barrack, uh, as it is uh, now in the new merged uh, company. And, and I think those things, if you can keep them alive, they're important. You know, memories of, you know, a DNA of an organization. And that's what I've spent the last two years doing is really re-establishing that DNA, that real uh, moral stru and, and entrepreneurial structure of what made Barrick so successful. Excellent. Does that feed in? I mean, my question was going to be, how do you recruit for the next Hall of Famer? Given that Barrick now is such a, I mean, those early days of Barrick now to being one of the global leaders, very different demands, different challenges. Um, how do you how do you approach that? So I, you know, like we, like I believe, uh, mining uh, companies need to invest in their future, and uh, and if you don't invest in your future, it's a consumptive industry. It dies. Likewise, we need to invest in our people, and and that's something that the industry has neglected. And so it's not whether we recruit Hall of Fame uh, potential candidates. We need to grow them. And more than ever, this industry needs to grow. It needs to invest in its future human capital. Because for too long now, we've sort of lived off an aging um, uh, leadership in the mining industry. And... And so that's certainly, it's the way we built Rand Gold Resources. Um, it's, it's the early stages of, uh, you know, I always remind people when we started, when I started, when Peter started, we didn't have all that many, many years of experience. 
but we had good people around us. And, um, and so, yeah, that's what I, and I've, I fundamentally believe uh, we need to invest in our young people because if we're going to take our real place in the world, the global economy, we've got to be more acceptable to future generations. And you don't do that without young people. Absolutely. Are you seeing, I mean, it's a big challenge of our industry. We do have, as you said it beautifully, we have all that intellectual capital with, a, with, an, with an aging demographic. Are you seeing any traction? I mean, you're, you're the type of executive that's on the ground. You're visiting mines. You're in touch with a, a lot of people. You probably see more of the industry than any of us uh, do in a lifetime. You see it in a year. Are you seeing positive traction there? Are you seeing touch points or ideas that are connecting with that younger generation and making oh, yeah. them want to come into our industry? Absolutely, uh, Anthony. Um, you know, uh, again, in West, in Africa, if you look at our African teams, uh, which we train, so our, some of our executive leadership in Africa today join me as um, as students, and they're now leaders, and and the African, um, and and we have got a, a situation here where where we have better skills in Africa, which is a lot younger as a mining destination than, uh, than we have in parts of North America. Mm -hmm. And so, and what we've done even through COVID is we've already reached out to the young people in Nevada because we believe in, in, in investing in our host country um, human capital. And, and, and you know, Nevada is probably as big as most of our countries we operate in. And so we look at uh, Nevada as a as a as a as a country, effectively. And and again, we had too many expatriates in Barrick. We had lost the D DNA. We had lost its mojo, and we needed to reestablish that. And so, and you know, when you put all the different cultures together, that I did in um, in the beginning of 2019, um, to get one culture, you need a single set of DNA. And, and, and therefore you have to in, invest in education, both internally and externally. And the best way to change a culture is to bring in young people because they're more creative. You know, the young people of today, first of all, they teach themselves. Uh, and, and secondly, they have a vision and they want to be part of something that's constructive. So the very nature of having younger people in your organization you, 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 you set a new set of criteria for why you come to work in the morning. Excellent. I think that speaks to the reinvigoration that, uh, that you've brought to the, to the Barrick team for sure. I'd like to kind of focus a little bit on the actual business now. Obviously, this incredible record of success with Rangold, that maybe feels like a lifetime ago for you now. I don't know, even though it was only three years ago. Um, but some of the secret sauce that the industry would talk about for Rangold, I mean, you were very vocal about some of the filters you were using, right? The 3 million ounce kind of criteria, high IRR of about 20%, um, conservative long-term gold price. How has that evolved in the in the barrack setting? Obviously, a bigger company, different kind of metrics, harder to find. I'm sure 20% IRR on some of the projects. How what are what are the filters looking like now? So we 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 moved from a world class uh, three million ounce 20% return to a much bigger target because barrack is a much bigger business, yeah. and we had two of those already. We call them tier one assets. So we now look for more than 5 million ounces and we want and bigger assets uh, you, you know you get bigger value but it's harder to get those IRRs up into 20 percent so we set the IRR initially at 15 percent but essentially what we define as a tier one asset now and, and you know everyone in the market sort of um, <laughs> changed the definition to suit their their, their circumstances but the, 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 the hard definition is 500,000 ounces a year for more than 10 years, supported by a defined inventory, be it reserves or resources, and, um, and at the lower half of the all-in sustaining cost curve. And so, so that really sets out, and there are only like 14 of them in the world. We have six. Uh, we have a couple of assets that are... Um, that are 500,000 ounce producers, but they don't make the financial cut. And so we don't call them tier one. They are big and they're strategic and they're important in our business. 
And 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 again, the the and we do those numbers at twelve hundred long term gold price. And just to give you some background, uh, I have a standard model we developed in in back in nineteen ninety seven, nineteen eight. Uh, which gave a twenty something return uh, at um, at uh, a gold price then of uh, four four hundred and fifty. Uh, this is before it went down to two sixty, and we kept that for a long time. Two thousand and nine, we well two thousand and seven, we lifted it to six fifty, and then in two thousand and ten, we lifted it to a thousand, and we stayed there from two thousand and uh, two thousand to two thousand and twenty nineteen. And when we did the Barrick deal, those and, and the way we tested it, so we test our long-term gold price against an input model. And what we did in the Barrick deal is that the input model had changed again. And, and we felt it was appropriate to lift it uh, from the 1,000 to 1,200. And we did that at the, the first round of reserve definition uh, in the end of 2019. And we've kept it ever since. And it's a good discipline. And sure, there's inflation uh, pressures now on the on the input costs, and we'll manage that. Um, uh, but but right now, we see that that discipline keeps the quality of your assets, and it forces you to find them because you can't buy them. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, every now and then, there is an opportunity to to grow through um, through uh, M and A, but it it definitely prevents you from uh destroying value in in times when the market is baying for deals right which we saw so much of in the last bull cycle oh, um, yeah. and I, I i do want to come to that well maybe we'll come to that now i mean you have in the past uh, been a vocal critic you've gotten up in the front that the gold industry you know needs to smarten up a little bit on uh, return on uh, investment where do you see that tracking in the right direction that we've come out of that last bear market? I hope that lessons have been learned. There is a critique that they never get learned <laughs> in the cold industry. What's your sense of in general, how the industry is coming out of this or coming into this next bull market? So it's a very good question. And, and you, you know, um, my critic is that actually through the behavior of many fund managers, um, we, we keep forcing the gold industry into a trading uh, platform and not uh, developing long-term value. And so for me in, the, in, in coming out of 2018 and the, and the engagement uh, you know, with the Barrick um, and, uh, and then the uh, joint venture in Nevada with Newmont and then Newmont's acquisition of um, of Gold Corp and 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 again our uh, acquisition of Acacia, and then and then the Endeavour consolidation in West Africa, and subsequently that, that the the Kirkland Lake acquisition of Detour, those were all great deals, um, and they were at the right time of the market and they delivered value, um, but there were a lot of deals that were left out. Uh, because uh, and and certainly there was interest to consolidate the the industry and it was a good time to do it. It was n it was near the bottom of the market, not quite. And you can never, as you know, Anthony, you can't choose the bottom bottom or the top. But um, it was a right time, and I was very outspoken about some of these transactions. Uh, these single asset companies should be wrapped up because then you can invest on the back of that investment. And, uh, you know, fixing broken assets is, is, in, in an industry where the average life of mine is 10 to 15 years, maybe, and right now it's even less. The average life of mine in the gold industry now is under 10. Makes it more difficult and it makes it more difficult to consolidate the industry. And so it, then it, basically the, the, the fund managers, as they often say, they want to have that control. Um, and, and I think that's unhealthy because the, the amount of, you know, the capital under management in these big public funds now is looking for more and more relevance. So the Newmont deal and the Barrick transaction that consolidated into a bigger organization really created and attracted significant alternate investors. Right. Um, and, and, I, you know, I, and, and Barrick today, and I, I'm really excited about Barrick, because we we also 
use the opportunity like Rand Gold did back in the, the last bull market to tidy up the portfolio and focus on value and a horizon that was beyond that of the horizon of the industry. And we, and we did everything we said we would do. We, we migrated the ownership and accountability of the mines to the mine management. We moved the ownership of the ore body and its planning responsibility there. We held those. Uh, so we had to change the management teams to real business people supported by competent technical uh, experts. And we've done that over the last two years and we've invested in people and we've invested in our future. And you, you would, uh, anybody who's watching Barrick start, starting to see now us talk more and more about the green fields. Last three years, we talked about how do we extend our life of mines. Now we're talking about how do we build on top of that platform. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, the latest round of consolidations, it's near the top of the market, whichever way you look at it, maybe not the absolute top, but when you look at the margins, yep. you know, an industry doesn't keep these sort of margins all the time. And, um, and so, you know, they, they, you've got to ask yourself the question. And, and I think that if we, as, as I've said before, if we had worked together as management and as uh, fund managers, because we, we in the same canoe, we could have created more value. And, you know, I think coming out of this bull market in the future, that's always the test. Will we better be more valuable then than we were going in? And, you know, I, I think the jury's out on that. <laughs> And, 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 and I think we could have done the, the job better. I think we did it a lot better than the last cycle, a lot. Uh, but there's still more to do. And, and the world's changing. So, again, you need, you know, I just think you need better uh, management, more competent technical people. We are short of engineers. We need to invest in our, our future, not only in the sense of exploration. All right. Well, that's, that's one of the biggest issues of the day. So thank you for that. I would, for me, the other big, I think for all of us, the other big issue of the day is inflation. I, I'd like to tie this to your comments about Greenfield. So you have, you are on the record. We need to build more mines. The industry listens when you speak, Mark, and that's, that's had a ripple effect. Now, but the, the issue seems to be more mines being built in an inflationary environment. Well, I, I want, uh, this is a two-tier question. One, what is your take on inflation? Are you aligned with the governments that are telling us, oh, this is just, you know, short-term supply chain stuff. This will get sor sorted out. Or is this a larger function of too much money in the system? And two, if it is the latter, if we are in for inflation for a while, how do you mitigate against that if we're building new mines? Ostensibly, these would be mines that are being built at the margin. So they're going to be higher cost mined into a cost inflationary environment. How does, you're uniquely positioned here as the, the head of one of the most important gold companies uh, to, to give your view on this. What are your thoughts around that? Okay, so, so inflation is definitely on its way. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, inflation in the gold mining industry specifically, well, you know, the fact is that, that we've been lazy uh, in the gold mining industry. And, by, and, and, you know, a few years ago, copper was nearly, was in the doldrums. And people had to tight, tighten their belts, and they they needed and they put suspended some operations. Gold industry had a long, good run, and and the, some of the question, uh, some of the points around infl cost increase in the gold industry gets confused with deteriorating grade. So, grade quali quality, the quality of your asset is really, you know, in mining, your revenue is your ore body. Yep. So you understand your ore body, you understand your revenue. And, and the gold industry has not replaced the gold it's mined since the two, turn of the century. So in the last 20 years, it's averaged about 50% of replacement of the total ounces mined, new, new gold mined. So we have a challenge. Um, at the same time, so we've got two legs to the inflations, inflation. Inflation, which drives the gold price because you devalue money. And, um, and then there's the input costs of your operations. And, and, and again, as managers, we should be all about cost control, efficiencies, automation, taking our industry to, to the future. 
And again, I think there's a lot in there. And, and you know, um, since 2019 in Barrick, we've taken out hundreds of millions of dollars of costs. And, and just by focusing on that basic, we act like owners. Yep. We run our business as though we own the whole business. And so, and I'm excited about, and we still got more to do. And, and again, when you look at um, the demands on new ways to generate cleaner energy, and therein should lie further opportunities to uh, improve your one's efficiencies. And likewise, when you look at automation, and automation doesn't take jobs away. It just produces higher quality jobs. And, and you can mine, it drops the grade, it, it increases the life of mine, does lots of good things. Um, and, and again, this, and, and then when you look, at, and, and if you allow me, Anthony, you know, you think inflation's the problem. We got a major problem globally as, an, as a global uh, group, as, a, as humanity, because we were well on the way on to globalization. When we went into this COVID crisis, uh, you know, everyone was worried about an all everything bubble because everyone was concerned about the market. Suddenly it's all fine because we've, we've grown in three years into insular uh, communities um, driven by populism and we have driven deglobalization. And we can't solve anything in this rapidly growing world as far as people go if we don't act in a global sense. And if we're going to behave in any, any way close to what we did in managing COVID, we're in for a hard time. So I believe this world is, and it will work itself out as it always does, but whenever you get to these points, whether it was 2008 or 1999 or 1987, and I've lived through those, those uh, uh, sort of big corrections in the world, we're due a very big one. Uh, we've worked really hard to bring it about. And, um, and I think that that's the driver of, you know, you must have your 5%, your mandatory 5% in your investment for portfolio in the form of some sort of gold, whether it's physical or equity. And, uh, and you know, and, and, and definitely uh, Barrick is going to be part of that. You know, I don't know if you know this, but Peter Monk, Drove his idea of a big gold business like Barrick was driven by the uh, the world's view on South Africa and apartheid, and he felt if he could build a gold business uh, outside South Africa to compete with the then big guerrilla South African mining companies, it was a great business to do, and he got it right. And 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 I think there's in in a twist to that the story. Um, definitely gold has a place, as does copper um, in, um, in the future of our world. And, uh, and, you know, whilst E of the ESG is absolutely critical uh, and more the environment rather than getting too far away from that, you know, stop polluting our own environment. It's the things we should do. But the S part of it is as important because if we don't look after poverty and bring the majority of humanity with us and develop the world, we can do all the environmental work we want. We won't be able to deliver a better world for future generations. And I think that that's, you know, we can do it proactively or we can do it through necessity. And I think we've arrived at that point of necessity. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and I think a big global economic shock will, will help us appreciate how necessary it is. Mark, there's a lot to unpack there. It leads wonderfully to my next question. Uh, you have a long track record of walking uh, the talk when it comes to social responsibility, when it comes to being able and I say walking the talk, not lightly. It's one thing for people to say things. It's one thing for people to, you know, donate to local communities. It's another thing to actually engage communities and governments to such a degree that you can build minds, 
where other people can't. <laughs> you did it at Rangold. You've handled some really tough political situations at Barrick and brought them to a positive conclusion. Um, I need to use this time uh, to give you a bit of a platform. What are, are there certain guiding principles that you use that could be a benefit to the rest of the industry? Um, because there's not many. I mean, I think there's you and probably Lucas Lundin would be the two that come to mind that are able uh, to get things done in tough situations. What principles help you do that? You know, I think the most important thing is treat people like people. And with respect, have a, you know, I talk, talked about DNA. That, you know, in, in Rangold and in Barrick, we as a team, as a whole company, you want to sign up because we've got disparate cultures, right? Because we work globally, you know, and, and from different regions, different eth ethnicities, different, uh, you know, beliefs, uh, different religions. But what glues us together is the DNA, the Barrick corporate DNA. We want to be transparent, honest, accountable, respectful. We do what we say. We respect the environment. Anything we do needs to be uh, able to exploit our partnership uh, vision. We want to be global. Uh, we want to make a difference to all our stakeholders. We recognize our host countries as uh, stakeholders that are as important as our shareholders and, uh, and the communities around our minds. And when, when you, when you, when you and, and, and the other thing as a global business, we should make a difference, you know? And so it's sort of strange for me to listen to people saying, if, I, if you want me to invest in you, you need to go back to the United States because it's safe. And I'm saying, if we want to make a difference, you know that we stand by Western and democratic principles. And we got to go out there and change the world because we do, because we drag infrastructure, we give people their first job, we give them their first qualified job. We, we do things that no one, no other industry does. And, um, and so for me that, and that's always been the point, you know, I grew up in apartheid. I witnessed and uh, the, the, the wrong of apartheid in every, every way. I was a young student when, you know, people started arguing against that uh, uh, political venture and um and and participated in the the actions to bring it to an end and um and I, you know i think it taught me a lot and and you know when you when you when you witness the the great leaders of those times and i you know i point specifically to nelson mandela we were we were all part of that that era um, as younger people and he was a little older than me but you know and 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 the clerk who recently passed away who was, had the courage to accept that what was being done was wrong. And then all the others, the peace accord. I was a young executive within the Balaran group, but that was part of it. My chairman was the, the chairman of the peace accord. And we learned a lot from each other. And, and um, you know, my, my business training was at Cape Town at, at the very time, you know, uh, in the late eighties, as everyone was wrestling with, how do you, how do you bring a democ democracy to a, this a country like South Africa? And so, um, and then we saw the, I witnessed the end of the Cold War. I fought in the, the war uh, as a young 18 year old before the end in, in the Cold War in, in, in Angola. And, um, and so, and then you had the end of the Cold War and, and everything that went after that. So you had the liberation of South Africa, the end of the Cold War. The, the, the re-establishment of the sub-Saharan region, which is what, why I created Rangold Resources. And, you know, we've got a cycle. We've, we're seeing the change and the pressures of socialism in South America at the moment. There's lots of that. But, you know, whether it's Argentina or Nevada, as you know, Nevadans uh, sought to really punish the mining industry uh, last year. And we engaged with them and we taught them about who we are brought them up to Northern Nevada and, you know, and, and, and I, and we, we made it a real live thing. And, 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 and we got a, we built a friendship, we built a bridge and the same in Tanzania, you know, Barrick had a few challenges, uh, you know, had created a bit of a, a number of uh, frontiers. 
and um, and we had to go out there and, and work with them. And, and every time you go and meet with people and you meet with the leadership um, and you and you make yourself part of the, you know, you advocate for who you are. Because when you do that, you better be right. Because otherwise people will hold, you know, they'll punish you. And, and I think that's really the building block of that. And, I, you know, when I speak about it, I'm, I've just watched Young people and old people within Barrick embrace this. And, and you know, sure, we've got anti-mining groups and we've got people who have crit criticisms or don't share the same views as us. But if we embrace everyone in a, and, and are proud and can demonstrate what we do makes a difference, changes people's lives, there are very few people who will, will continue beating you. Excellent. Excellent. Mark, we're so appreciative of your time. We're closing in here on the final few seconds. One game I do like to play when we have leaders of the industry on is a game called Bull or Bear. I'm just going to rapidly fire off some broad themes, and you tell me whether you're bullish or bearish on what I throw out to you. The first right. one, a gold executive, you got to ask, the U.S. dollar, bull or bear? Bear. COVID-19 remaining a negative societal factor through 2022. Now, I don't know if, how do I answer that? It's not going to be a negative. Okay, so you are bearish on that statement, but you're bullish on society overcoming it. <laughs> that was, I agree, I didn't frame that one very easily. China as the world's imminent superpower. Are you bullish or bearish on China becoming the next imminent superpower? No, I'm bearish. Excellent. Cryptocurrencies. Yeah, completely bearish. <laughs> I, I would hope so. And the, the final one, we parsed this one out a little bit from cryptocurrencies, blockchain. So blockchain is important in, in a new global current currency. You know, we're moving to to electronic money. And, you know, so there's a definitely. And, uh, and you know, the, we essentially have uh, central bank electronic money already but it doesn't have the, the necessary uh, security that blockchain or that type of technology brings. Excellent. Mark, again, we are so appreciative of both your time and your insights. Have a great rest of the day, and thank you again. Anthony, thank you very much. Appreciate Cheers, Mark. it. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.